um, and thank you for the org to the organizers for inviting me. Um, the last time I was here was about four years ago, and I was, I think, stood in this very room giving a presentation about partnerships. And it feels like the conversation has moved on quite a lot in that space. I'd like to give us a little bit of pause for thought, in a sense. What I should say is that with regard to partnerships, the organization that I run is called Partnerships in Practice. I've worked with partnerships over the last 20 years, um, maybe about 150 different partnerships, maybe 200. And I would probably suspect that I'm one of the biggest skeptics about partnerships that you'll find in this room. So whilst I've worked with them, whilst the term is in my name, my organization's name, I actually uh, don't believe in them. So here you've asked me to come speak to you about partnerships, and it's the, 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 the after lunch session, right? So I'm trying to provoke you, obviously, and I hope, that, hope that's working. But I actually think that partnerships are an unnatural arrangement. I actually think that they don't really work. And I've seen very few of them that actually do work. So I want us to kind of step back a little bit, and before we rush into more and more and more partnerships, I want us to think through actually what makes them work, what makes them fail, and how do you actually design them in such a way that they do what we want them to do. So there's my caveat. Apologies for those of you that thought you were going to get a uh, yay for partnerships. All right, so I've, I've been asked to talk about prospects and pitfalls for innovation in partnerships. So what I'm trying to do is to weave together some of the conversation we've had over the last 24 hours around innovation, but through a partnership lens. So we've had some very interesting comments about real data, and does that equate to real-time organizations? We've had some issues around, uh, Zach was talking yesterday about the uh, fixing what's broken, but are we actually fixing the system? So for me, partnerships are about a systemic approach. So you can have partnerships which either put in, so okay, so most of my background is in water and sanitation. Again, most of the 20, almost 20 years on partnerships has been in water and sanitation, mostly in Africa, but also in Latin America and some in Southeast Asia. Um, so I'm putting it into the context of water and sanitation, which is a wicked problem if there is, if there is one. Water is a definition, by definition, a wicked problem. The reason it's a wicked problem is because the solutions to water and sanitation actually have nothing to do with water and sanitation. So you've got a bunch of engineers, apologies to all my engineering friends, and a, punch, a bunch of economists, apologies to all my economy friends, who are busy trying to find financial and technical solutions to a problem actually that has very little to do with, uh, sorry, that water has very little to do with those kinds of solutions. The issues around water are about land management, they're about marginalized uh, people without a voice, they're about the political will, they're about investment in a broader sense, etc. So when we try to find hand pumps, and apologies to those who work on hand pumps, when we try to find new tariff structures or something like that, it's not going to cut it. Because actually it's all about what happens upstream, what happens downstream, who wants what, and how do they want it. Right? So it's all the kind of convoluted, messy, I think you referred to yesterday, notions of development, and water just suits that to a T. Okay, so that's kind of the, 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 the background of where I'm coming from. Lita referred to this distinction between public-private partnerships, which for me, I, I have always thought of those more as a contractual kind of arrangement with multi-stakeholder initiatives. And you can see that one is regulated, and the other is not regulated. It operates in a regulated environment, but the partnership, as Lita said, is not regulated. One has lots of stakeholder engagement. One has, in essence, very little, unless you're talking about public hearings or things like that. So that's, again, the context. So looking at this through the lens of innovation, we know that you can have innovation. I know that the, the, general, the general sense is that we focus on innovation as technologies, as widgets, or as little things that we can do that are of a technical nature to fix a problem. But actually, you can have innovation around service delivery models. You can have innovation around different approaches, whereby you've got different governance structures, etc. So innovation can take lots of shapes. But as soon as we hear the word innovation, in English at least, we think of the mechanics, a, a mechanism, a machine, something. That's our initial response. So I want us to kind of think more broadly about what innovation actually is. So when we look at the enablers for innovation, it all depends on risk. And what are our attitudes to risk? So, for example, with a certain innovation, how risky is that innovation 
in terms of the scale or the ambition. So are we trying to reach an entire city, you know, through a condominial sewerage system in, in La Paz, in Bolivia? Are we trying to actually reach an entire city through uh, a, a different type of, of intervention? The second question is how radical the innovation is. How different is the innovation in terms of what I'm used to and how I get my water and sanitation services or how I get my energy services or what it might, what it, whatever it might be. So how, how different is what you're asking me to accept from what I currently do? The third area is around whether and how innovation and risk are accepted, valued, recognized, rewarded. And I think what we're starting to see, and maybe my colleagues will dispute this, is that of late, the last two or three years, and I speak more from the UK side, which is where I'm based, than I do from the Spanish side, which I know very little about, in fact, we see much more of an emphasis on very, uh, in a way, a lack of risk taking, a very conservative approach. You see this from the, the DFIDs, you see it, sorry, the UK Development Assistance Agency, you see this from the NGO side, you see this in a way from the company's side. Failure is not an option, we're not allowed to fail. You can't take risks and have an attitude of not failing. They don't go together. You have to allow yourself to fail in some instances. So what we're seeing is an emphasis on results-based finance, an emphasis on value for money, an emphasis on all these kind of impact measurements are taking away our ability to think outside the box and actually to take risks. So what I'm appealing for is that we structure partnerships in such a way that that provides us with the space to take risks. So there are a couple different ways that you can, you can get around these, um, these barriers to innovation. One is to try to influence or overcome the obstacle or the barrier. So for example, um, what they did in La Paz 10, 15 years ago was to bring the regulator into the partnership. The regulator was not a partner, but the regulator was an observer. What that did was it allowed the conversation to change so that you could actually influence the standards, the regulations, the norms. So that was actually trying to influence from the inside. You can try to circumvent and go around what the barrier is. So in Cartagena, uh, in Colombia, they had a system whereby you couldn't bill households on a monthly basis. Sorry, you could only bill households on a monthly basis for water services. Households didn't want that. They wanted to pay on a weekly basis or more frequently. So what they did was they tried to create intermediaries to, in a way, circumvent the rules. So you had intermediaries which allowed you to, to collect money in a different kind of way. Or, obviously, what you see is that partnerships, sometimes they move away from the actual barrier that's, that's, that's put in place. So what I've done is I've put, to, I've put forward a series. You'll see that I'm talking more at the macro level, and my colleagues will talk more specifically about specific cases. But what you need to understand or what you need to look for within the design of partnerships is who has what influence. So you're trying to figure out who actually, to make an innovation stick, to use Malcolm Gladwell's terms, to make an innovation stick, what you're looking for is trying to figure out who's got the influential voice. And maybe that's the mayor. Maybe that's Beyonce. You know, we don't know who that influential voice might be. But we actually need to figure out who is it that's actually going to percolate this influence throughout the system. The person who's speaking, who has the influence, you need to understand what their interests are, but you also need to make sure that they have legitimacy. So in order to, to, get, a, to get an innovation through the system, you have to make sure that that person who's pushing it actually has the legitimacy to be talking about it. Whether it's because they're accreditation, they're a, you know, a bona fide scientist, whether it's because they use the technology themselves, whoever, whatever it might be. The second question is who has what responsibility? So this is something that Lita and I have talked about quite a lot um, in terms of whether there is, um, who has what mandate to provide what services or what uh, technologies or et cetera. Who has the responsibility? So what we're seeing is a lot of times the move is away from the public sector towards the pu private sector or towards individuals or community groups. Again, you're starting to see a movement whereby we're placing a lot of emphasis and even a lot of pressure on the individual to provide their own services or to respond to their own needs, whereby the public sector abdicates responsibility. So the public sector, maybe it's finding ways through partnerships to actually step back. And this is something that I'm going to push against and provoke in a way. What you need to understand here is who makes what claims on the system. 
Which communities are likely to speak out? What claims do they have? What entitlements do they have? The next area is around who and how are partners reliant on each other? How do they actually interrate, interrelate? What do they contribute? What are the resources that they put on the table? We spend a lot of time talking about the finance, and the finance seems to take precedence over a lot of other things that we put on the table. So we tend to denigrate or disabuse or neglect the, the, the NGOs, for example, who put on the table social license, sorry, um, um, community engagement or social voice or those kinds of things. The money tends to drive what we do. And whether that's responsible or not, I don't know. The next area is around creative tension. The reason that you create partnerships in the first place is to build on this creative tension. You want to bring together the NGO, the public sector, the private sector in order to creatively solve a problem. Otherwise, why do it? You'd have a contract. Just put a contract in place to put the pipes in the ground. Again, speaking from a water perspective. So what you want is this creative tension which actually allows them to elevate the conversation somehow. So this makes you figure out what are the power dynamics and what are the prioritizing and how do you sequence things. So this is a, a, a graph that we were looking at earlier where you're trying to balance the interests between innovating and accountability, between putting in standpipes but also changing policy. So what you see is that partnerships kind of operate in this space where they're trying to, they're trying to move from one quadrant to another, whereby they're trying to actually get a sustainable development move in place by focusing on that middle ground that, that balances innovation with accountability and balances task focus, by that I mean actual infrastructure investment, with some kind of policy change which allows standards and, and, and norms and regulations to change. The next area is around diversity. So again, we talked a little bit about creative tension, but also what we tend to see is that partnerships, by creating this table, it tends to move towards the lowest common denominator. We, move, we put a lot of emphasis on conflict resolution, whereby we all are trying to speak the same language. But in actual fact, again, what you're doing there is you're blunting, you're actually um, watering down the innovations that could actually come across from different perspectives on the issue. So you want to actually emphasize the diversity in the room and play it up. The next thing is around internal cohesion. So what you tend to see is that from an NGO perspective, from a, a government perspective, or from a private sector perspective, there tends to lack this internal cohesion inside the organization to actually speak with one voice inside the partnership. So an NGO may have a, a policy group who speaks about one thing, an implementation group who speaks about another thing, and a fundraising group who speaks about a third thing. Those things are not mutually compatible always within the NGO, and thereby the, the NGO representation can be quite confusing for external partners. You see the same thing with the private sector and the same thing with the government sector as well. So it's about that kind of internal cohesion that allows partners to speak with one voice. We talk a lot about trust. And the word trust comes up a lot within partnership language. And I guess what I've seen is I've seen lots of partnerships where the partners didn't trust each other at all. They didn't like each other, in fact. They didn't even want to be in the same room with each other. The only thing that you could do in order to make the partnership work was to create a process that they trusted, to create a process that was predictable so that they at least knew what was going to happen, even if they didn't like the person that was sat opposite them. Okay, so again, I'm trying to de-emphasize trust and emphasize some kind of predictability around the relationship. Now, what you see is that the context is constantly changing, and we're not trying to standardize all partnerships so that they look the same, but you're trying to make sure that people know within the partnership what's coming next. Finally, there's always obviously the practical issues about innovation, which we've talked about a lot over the last day and a half. Do we know what the market looks like? Have we got the timing right? Are elections coming? Is this the wrong time to put something in place? Do we have enough time? Have we given us an, ourselves enough time to actually do what we're trying to do? Has the resource allocation been appropriate? So those are kind of more practical issues which we've heard a number of times. I'll stop there and hopefully I've kind of provoked some, some questions or thinking that you can frame to my colleagues and not to me. Thank you.